afternoon and warm welcome to the Philips African Dialogues. I'm Samantha Loring. Sub-Saharan Africa still carries a disproportionate share of the global health burden with poverty and other related issues limiting access to health care. Now in a few places where government institutions are intervening, the quality of care often doesn't meet the greater needs of the population. So in tonight's show we'll be taking a closer look at the role of public-private partnerships that in addressing health care challenges on the continent. Joining me in studio today to share their insights, we've got Peter van der Fen, Vice President and General Manager for Philips Healthcare Africa, Yelko van der Afwert, Manager for the KPNG Healthcare Advisory, Professor Alex van der Hever, the Chair for Social Security at Witts University, and sitting next to me, Dr. Flavia Senku Buche, the Vice President for the African Federation for Public Health, and joining us from our Bureau in Lagos. Dr. Adedayo Oshulogu, the Chief Representative Officer for Africa from the Florence Nightingale Group. Uh, welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us today. So let's just start off by painting a picture as to the healthcare burden that we have on the continent. And Yelka, I'll start off with you because just looking at some of the numbers today certainly are quite uh, scary when we're looking at how much the healthcare burden is going to rise on the continent. Uh, but looking at it now, you've got low income countries uh, where we see the, the life expectancy 20 three years lower compared to high income countries. So just give us an idea as to, to how you see Africa's healthcare burden right now. All right, thanks. Um, it's, it's hard to say how 53 countries have share healthcare burden, but um, research has shown that 25% um, of the global healthcare burden sits on this continent, uh, whereas only 1% of GDP or 1% spent on healthcare is actually in Africa, and Africa only has 3% of the healthcare workforce. So I think that uh, paints the picture as what we're looking at and what governments are faced with. Mm -hmm. uh, and Peter, from your perspective, I mean, just looking at the, the burden this is going to place on the public sector, and as you say, it's really hard to generalize mm. in, in a continent where we've got 53 countries now, but uh, looking at it globally right now, I mean, healthcare is around 10% of global GDP spend, uh, that's set to rise. In, in Africa, I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of the burden that public sector players are going to, sh going to bear uh, going forward and are having to, to take on right now? Yeah. Now, what you see in Africa is that uh, traditionally there has been a lot of focus on communicable diseases. Uh, so HIV, AIDS, uh, malaria, uh, sanitation, clean water, etc. And what you see now is that there is really a, a shift to non-communicable diseases. Uh, so diabetes, stroke, uh, heart failure, cancer are coming up more and more and the infrastructure is really not yet geared uh, to take on these challenges. I believe that that is going to be one of the major issues uh, that Africa will face in the future, next to uh, uh, an enormous challenge in modern childcare, uh, uh, maternal mortality, child mortality. So uh, there is a lot of money going into Africa currently, also aid-related money, but the focus is still quite a lot on communicable diseases. And what we believe at Philips is that the shift is really required uh, to provide the means uh, to shift to non-communicable diseases uh, to face the challenges of today and the future. Mm -hmm. Dr. Senko Buche, just, I mean, just give us a little bit uh, of perspective as to, to the work that you do, the, the players across the continent uh, that you represent, and what stands out for you? I mean, are there any numbers that really paint a picture as to, to what we're looking at right now uh, from the, uh, you know, the healthcare sector? So I am from the African Public Health Association and the vice president of the organization. And this organization represents um, 50, all 53 African countries and all the public health associations within those countries. And Peter is absolutely right. Mm -hmm. uh, traditionally, we had communicable diseases, and now we're having this upsurge of non-communicable diseases. But over and above that, something that's very intriguing in other uh, African countries, you'll hear them talking about a quadruple burden of disease. And this is in addition to poverty-related uh, diseases and also violence and injury and absolutely in as much as we're talking about non-communicable diseases at the back of our minds we do know that we'll have to face and and we need an infrastructure of violence how to deal with violence and injury among the African population. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Alex, let's bring you into this uh, conversation right now because you're very much involved with dealing with the government here in South Africa with how to deal with uh, the South African uh, infrastructure needs in the, in the healthcare space. But, but, I mean, what's your assessment as to, to how uh, well-equipped governments are right now to roll out what is needed? I mean, where are the biggest issues that stand out in terms of their capabilities? 
Well, if, uh, you'll find a lot of similarities between uh, the experiences of South Africa and a lot of the rest of Africa. Part of the, uh, the uh, problem that we're seeing is sort of not just the burden of disease, but it's the way in which the public systems are able to, to cope efficiently with dealing with the problem. So if you look at something like maternal mortality ratios throughout Africa and South Africa, is that the performance is not consistent with the levels of expenditure, which means that even at fairly low levels of expenditure, which you pointed out Africa is, is developing, it should actually be performing better. So there is one key issue, which is the efficiency of the performance of the public system. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a number of countries, including South Africa, if, uh, uh, we're, we're actually spending at or beyond what we should be in the public sector, and yet we're, we're performing worse than many countries at about 25% of our per capita GDP in a lot of other developing const continents. But in Africa, you see a bit of a, a very similar experience on the whole. So uh, we, we what have do you bring that down to? And I suppose there's so many elements to that, if you could point to, to one or two of the most important factors. Well, systems design is a key issue. And uh, systems design includes not only the architecture of the overall health system, but also how it's governed. So the actual, there isn't a strong emphasis in a lot of countries in Africa um, and in some developing countries on the development of, of coherent accountability frameworks that go together with a systems design. And that means really how you make sure that systems actually perform uh, effectively. Mm -hmm. So if you do not have the right structures for running hospitals and you do not have the right structures for running um, a health service administration, the accountability structure is weak. It means that they don't perform very well for the amount of money that is being spent on them. And I think that this is, for me, one of the most consistent features of a lot of African countries. Not all. There are some that are basically performing better than, sh than they should for the amount of GDP they have. Give, it, give us an example of one or two of those while we added. Well, Ghana is performing very well mm -hmm. uh, relative to its GDP and you'll find uh, uh, um, uh, Uganda you will see sort of reasonably good performance coming through and a number of others although their performance is quite uh, is, is relatively weak in relation to its per capita GDP it's, it's outperforming what you'd expect for their level level of GDP South Africa is performing probably the worst in the world in relation to its per capita GDP and so these are all uh, pointers so in, in Southeast Asia you will find countries like Vietnam performing extremely well and they're way smaller than South Africa in terms of its its overall economic capability yeah let's bring Dr. Oshilowu into the conversation of course uh, joining us Dr. from from Lagos tonight and you of course are representing the Florence uh, Nightingale Hospital Group you've got ambitions to open up hospitals across Africa what role do you see the private sector playing in the provision of healthcare infrastructure in Africa? A recent McKinsey study put the need for investment in healthcare infrastructure across Africa at over $20 billion. And um, we realized that um, the private sector has a key role to play in um, providing this money. Um, in Nigeria and a lot of other African countries, um, the current health budget isn't really um, um, meeting up to the needs of uh, infrastructure. You have the population growing at an astronomic rate. You have um, disease burden increasing astronomically, but um, there's a big challenge on the health infrastructure. Last year alone, a World Bank study put the um, healthcare spend by Nigerians out of Nigeria at over um, $200 million. So, um, but we in the industry know that these numbers are on the low side. You know, it's, it's more in the range of half a billion dollars. So Nigerians spent half a billion dollars at hospitals seeking um, care for non communicable chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cancer, um, and they spent um, this money. Um, so there's a huge demand for health care, but on the supply side, we don't have the infrastructure meeting up to this challenge. So the private sector has a big role to play in um, raising this money and structuring it such that um, the necessary investments are made and not just that the investments are made but that health outcomes improve. So we're talking about building new hospitals but also ensuring that these hospitals meet up to global standards and that um, health outcomes are um, such that um, patients are getting value for the money that they spend. So First Nightingale is one of the leading hospital groups in Istanbul and a decade, two decades ago the health outcomes were almost the same. Most Turkish citizens left Turkey to um, buy healthcare out of Turkey, but today the reverse is the case. 
you have most of the rest of Europe going to Turkey now to um, visit hospitals in Turkey. And the reason is because, and if you see from research, Turkey has um, across the world um, the highest number of PPP projects in healthcare. Uh, and so uh, we are bringing that expertise into Africa because we realize that um, there's a big need for health infrastructure. There's a need for innovation to develop public-private partnerships to structure finance for these hospitals across the continent, and we want to play a key role in this. Mm -hmm. And we'll get, of course, into some of those interesting models that you're bringing uh, to the continent right now. But, but let's talk about government's mindset and where government's heads at when it comes to bringing on board uh, the private sector. I mean, Yelko, what are your thoughts? Because, uh, you know, just looking again at some of the numbers, is say, saying that a modern hospital with 300 beds can treat more patients than, say, an old hospital with around 600 beds. Government can be presented with those facts, but still be quite reluctant to hand over, you know, the, the role of provision of health care to the private I mean, what are your thoughts in terms of governments in Africa and their, their head with regard to that? I think it's important to look at the bigger picture as well. Healthcare is not the only thing governments want to invest in. Um, may, most of the governments in Africa also want to invest in power and in transport, whether that be port, airports or infrastructure. And healthcare is not always on top of their list. I think it's important to understand that bigger picture they're looking at as well. Um, then when it comes to governments coming on board and, inv and, and investing in healthcare, I'm convinced that they need the private sector to, come, to jump on board with them. Um, studies have shown that there's a need for over 500,000 additional beds on the African continent. And there's no way I think that government is going to fund that all uh, by themselves. Um, and in order to um, derive more value out of money, I think it's, uh, there's a role for private sector to play in this as well. Did you find governments, and yes, again, we're generalizing, but your experience in Africa right now, are governments starting to become more accepting of the private, play, private sector playing an uh, increasingly important role and a very strategic partners in the provision of healthcare? Well, I believe that governments have always been receptive uh, to the private sector coming in. I think one of the big issues is also the funding uh, that is connected uh, to it. But if I look at the experience that we have as Philips, you do not necessarily need to take over completely as private sector to be able to play a leading role uh, and a partnership role with the governments. Uh, you can also support them uh, by together with them investigate what are their requirements. Together with them make a plan which is connected to their priorities. And based on that, bring in the technology and bring in the infrastructure as private partner to the government and seek then also the financial solutions mm -hmm. to match that. Uh, there is a lot of discussion about PPP. The first question that I always raise is what is your definition of PPP? Mm -hmm. uh, because there are many, many different uh, initiatives uh, that are being a partnership between the private sector and governments that are qualified as PPP but are maybe in the true sense not a PPP like the ones that have been mentioned in Turkey. But that doesn't mean that such a partnership cannot be very, very effective. Uh, and we have the proof. We have done uh, these partnership uh, deals with uh, various governments in Africa. We have been working together with the government of uh, Ghana, the government of Tanzania, the government of Zambia, the government of Kenya, where together with the government we looked at their requirements, uh, looked at the scope of the activities, because that is very, very important to have a real good outline scope, uh, and based on that set up an infrastructural development project um, which has been very effective because if you look at uh, the statistics, for instance, of the WHO, less than 50% of all the equipment that is available in Africa is actually functional. And that can be for two reasons. Either it's broken and there is no service structure. Second is people don't know how to use it because the training has not been conducted effectively. Mm -hmm. So those are the elements that you also have to bring into uh, the game to ensure that you have a sustainable project. And we as Philips, we have been able in these projects to realize an availability and uptime of equipment of higher than 90%. Mm -hmm. Alex, if you were advising government, a government right now, I mean, what would you say what they should understand their role in healthcare provision being? I mean, can, can we talk about, uh, you know, that changing, of course, to the, to the specific country? I mean, what would your advice be, be to them generally? Well, in, in uh, health systems design, what you would want to do is to, is to be able to mix the, the two systems. The one benefit of a private system is it's more responsive whereas a public system has to kind of has to be planned 
and you've got people making decisions based on prioritization and it can be slow and it can be unresponsive. So the issue is to get the benefits of both these systems is to be able to leverage off the responsiveness of the private sector to enhance what the public sector can do. But that requires that you well, Then what is the public sector's you know, primary role? Well, their primary role, well, they've got a number of objectives. One would be to, for instance, deal with the burden of the, the key, the priority burdens of disease and to prioritize health care and basic health care. But they also have a responsibility to make sure that the entire health system works, which actually deals with more than just basic health care needs. And within that framework, you can, you can mix and match between the public and private sectors. But it depends very much on whether or not you've invested in the capabilities to have these two sectors talk to each other. And very often, that's the one thing that governments do not invest in. So the greatest weakness, for instance, in, in South Africa would be that we haven't developed the, the capabilities of the public platform to talk coherently to the private sector. Mm -hmm. So they, you, it's not very easy to develop a public-private arrangement that's very flexible and responsive to a particular need if, if, if the public system can't manage the contract. And if the pub private sector, which is wanting to allocate the contracts, can't find a way of finding a partner. Mm -hmm. So we have difficulties in getting willing partners together in, in the system. And, and it will be, in many cases, more difficult in a lot of countries in, in Africa. And it is a difficulty here. And so it, within South Africa, one of the things that is being investigated at the moment is how to create that handshake, mm -hmm. to actually look at innovative structures that allow for contracts to be developed more flexibly on the public sector platform and to create a way of, uh, of consolidating and making a, and, and, and getting innovative contracts from the private sector to get them to talk more easily. So if you've got lots of medical schemes, how do you get them to contract with the public hospital? Mm -hmm. If you've got, it's, it's very difficult and they can't find a partner. And what if the hospital can't contract at that point? You need to contract with the provincial government. That is too far away from the service. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the appropriate point of entry for a contract. So you've got to find these flexibilities and, and create that capacity. So we don't have it fully. And that's why we have quite stodgy public-private partnerships stodgy private public partnerships that's an interesting way uh, to, to describe it i mean how would you uh, and how are you advising governments to be able to to create these kind of mechanisms to bring on board private sector players and and have that as you say handshake uh, and and then speaking to each other in the same language i think our uniqueness um samantha is that um public health associations have a, a multidisciplinary approach and so in that same room you have the government role player together with somebody who's delivering the service and also our um, private partners. And that's, I think, the beauty of using vehicles like public health associations. So in a way, the handshake is already in the room, but it's now to start the dialogue, um, and, and that's the beauty. And so for us, the big thing is opening up the dialogue. For instance, recently we, ha we held one of the first ever public health uh, meetings and dialogues for all public health associations in Africa. And so uh, I, would, I would go so far as to confidently say it's the first time ever that we've had every single public health person or person interested in public health in Africa coming together. And we had a lot of other people for, uh, internationally. And there we were debating Africa's public health legacy beyond 2015. And with that, the public-private partnerships are key. And I, th I think the, the resolutions that come out very strongly are first of all transparency. If you're gonna be sitting in a room with someone, you need to know what you are negotiating yeah. about. Second of all, you need to have accountability. And I think that's what Alex is basically saying. In terms of if we are having a partnership, who exactly is uh, accountable? Where does the buck stop? And then, third of all, you do need to have that sound governance. And so for the longest of time, one of the big things in African governments and, and, and the private players will tell you is that governance and a change of political system and that sound governance is not there. And of key, which is coming up very strongly, and you'll hear a lot of the dialogue coming up, is leadership, leadership, leadership. Who exactly is involved in leadership and how do we capacitate people mm -hmm. to be good leaders and to manage these contracts? Yeah. So pre 
previously in the in, in the early 70s we we actually did have some sort of working together but when we worked together um, as private and, and public sector we didn't really um, you know it was you managing the contract this is what you were supposed to do you build the hospital and that's it and then when you come back the hospital is, is dilapidated poor quality services and then the community says hang on we've got this new public uh, you know this new hospital but the quality of, uh, of health of the population hasn't improved. And as you say, that contract management and the contract manager mm -hmm. or managers is a very important element. Let's go back to, to the private sector perspective and bring you in once again, Dr. Uh, Oshilowu, because you'll be able to give us a perspective in terms of how you structure the deals you're working on right now, perhaps in Nigeria specifically, and what role do you see the government playing and is the government going to play in, in the uh, hospitals that you're planning to build? As um, the colleague from uh, Philip said, when we talk about public-private partnerships, there's a huge spectrum. On one side, you have um, uh, build, operate, and transfer, where um, um, is a partnership with the private player who um, builds the hospital, operates the hospital, and transfers it after a period to the government. On the other side, you have, um, and where the government has majority of the equity ownership of the infrastructure. On the other side, you have where um, all the equity in the project is owned by uh, the private players and the government offers um, concessions um, either for land or um, may create contracts and enter into contracts with the facility for um, certain cases that um, the hospital can care for but that the government doesn't have capacity to care for in the public system. Um, so you have a huge spectrum and I think um, in our experience um, today um, the role that the government really needs to play is more of a regulatory um, role um, for uh, the growth of um, PPPs in the health sector in Nigeria and the rest of the West African region. Um, we need to see a lot of policy changing. Uh, we need to see government leading um, this change of policy to make the um, environment more um, 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 comfortable for private investors and for private operators to play. We have a few projects um, where um, um, we're currently um, talking to the government uh, and the government is um, offering us um, certain concessions um, for land and private investors uh, formed a holding company which includes a technology partner, a hospital operator such as ourselves um, and private investors in private equity and also bank, uh, bank lenders uh, to create a holding company to build a, a hundred bed hospital somewhere in West Africa. Um, and in this, um, in this case, um, everybody is sort of focusing on their areas of expertise. Um, technology Partner is bringing uh, their expertise in um, hospital technology and also offering support, as um, the colleague at Philips um, has rightly mentioned, on the project. So we are guaranteed of um, over 90% uptime on the project. We have us as a hospital operator operating the project um, to international standards to ensure that um, health outcomes, so we're not just building a hospital, but that we can ensure that uh, we have the best um, clinical staff in the hospital and that health outcomes are at um, international standards. We also have um, our um, financiers and the bank lenders who are helping us structure um, very innovative financial solutions where, where um, there is um, leadership of uh, local investors. Another thing that uh, is a big part of our philosophy in making successful public-private partnerships is um, ensuring that you have a heavy local participation. Because you know healthcare is like politics. To make a successful healthcare project you have to have um, the buy-in of all the local stakeholders. You have to have local investors, you have to have local physicians, you have to have um, the local government all um, uh, having a major stake in the project. Mm -hmm. So um, for us um, the role that government um, should play in making successful PPP projects is creating an enlivening environment, focusing on um, regulating the policy to ensure that uh, we can create successful projects. Yeah. Peter, let's talk about some of the projects that you alluded to earlier on the continent because uh, you're not obviously just he Philips Healthcare is, is a global company. You've got interesting PPPs, for example, uh, one in Georgia in the United States, the uh, Georgia Regents Medical Center in the U.S., that a 15-year alliance between yourself and the medical center. So, so tell us a little bit perhaps about that and, and then you know talk to us more about some of the PPPs that you're involved in on the African continent. 
Okay, uh, well, the project in, uh, in Georgia uh, obviously has been handled by my US colleagues, but it is a 15-year agreement, uh, cooperation with the chain of hospitals, uh, in which we provide the technical know-how, the equipment, the training, uh, after-sales support over a period of 15 years. And, and I think there is a parallel uh, uh, to Africa, because if you look at the content of the projects that we have been done, uh, doing, and uh, I agree uh, with the gentleman from Nigeria, uh, that you also need to have local stakeholders and local content. Uh, the way that we have been doing the projects is that we have also been following the referral system, for instance, uh, something which we believe is uh, very, very important, because what you also see is uh, urbanization increasing and increasing, and with that also the pressure on the healthcare facilities and the system in the uh, urban areas. One of the reasons for that is that the facilities in the rural areas are not available to the public. So what do people do? They go immediately to the centers where they believe they can get the right treatment. So following the rural uh, uh, infrastructure and from there the referral system into regional hospitals, into the tertiary mm -hmm. uh, uh, care providers, that is uh, an essential element of the way that we are doing the projects. Um, next to that, we only do not only look at our own equipment, uh, we look at the total infrastructure. So we look at power, we look at water uh, supply, clean water, but we also look at other areas that are important. Uh, if you put uh, a nice x-ray machine uh, in a rural facility and you don't ensure that there is also some treatment possibility, uh, you will have gained nothing because somebody will come to the hospital, uh, an x-ray is uh, being taken and you detect a broken leg and the person is then being told that he has to walk 25 kilometers to the next facility to be treated. Yeah. So we look at that part as well. We look at training. There is a very, very uh, heavy training component involved of the in, staff, obviously. in the projects that we do, of the staff that needs to operate the equipment. And that is not only an initial training, but that is a training that continues throughout the duration of the project because staff has a habit to move. So if new pu uh, people come in and they don't know how to operate the equipment, you get exactly what I mentioned earlier. The equipment is standing idle, not being used because people simply do not know how to use it. Another element which is important is after sales support. Mm -hmm. uh, ensure that you have a structure in the country, and we do that by means of setting up workshops, regional workshops, uh, with qualified technical engineers that are capable of maintaining uh, the equipment. But we also bring in the government. Uh, we train biomets so that they are uh, able to do a first detection of the problem, ensuring that the time to repair is as short as possible. That is an area which we believe is important. Yeah. And last but not least, we also bring in local contractors uh, to help us in uh, setting up the entire project. Uh, when we go to hospitals, we uh, very often find that the rooms are not suitable to receive the equipment. So we use local contractors uh, to help us to reshape the rooms, to receive the equipment. Uh, we train local people, we hire local people. Uh, local people are working in our project offices. So not only are we supporting with technical know-how, we also bring employment to the countries to support us in setting up uh, and executing the project. What you also see is that the added value of all this is recognized, and after the initial period of a project, uh, which normally runs approximately seven years, uh, because you cannot do a country-wide project in a couple of months, um, that after that we actually enter into a commercial agreement with the government uh, to provide the service. And mm -hmm. we have equipment in the countries that I mentioned, which in the meantime is already 18 years old and is still up and running. Yeah, we're going to uh, hit a, sh a pause on this conversation because we're taking a quick commercial break now. But after the break, I want to talk more about international best practice and also examples of PPPs and how they're working here in Africa. Give you uh, some more examples from the African continent. And then we'll talk about designing these PPPs specifically for the African continent and all the nuts and bolts that have to go into the design of them. So, of course, we'll see you straight after the short break. <laughs> 